So this uh, picture is um, a more abstract design. It's not one I took. This one is a stock image, but I wanted everyone to think about all the different ways you can see wildflowers or flowers in general. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, how to set up and do different types of photography and some techniques. So to begin, my next screen is not a wildflower, but I just really felt like along the theme of haikus, um, I was over at Seven Bend State Park and they have a number of different uh, beekeeping houses there. And I got on the ground and I was, because there weren't many birds, I, I said, well, can I, can I get a bee in flight? Which is not the easiest thing to do. So, um, and they have an electric fence around the, where the, the beehives are. So I was lying there trying to get through the electric fence and said, I can, I can get a picture of a bee. And the amazing thing about the bees, because they were start, you could just see they were waking up and starting to get active and, and spring was coming, is if you look closely on, on this bee, it's covered with pollen. So we've got flowers out there. Um, there, is, there is pollen that's coming. And so it made me think about uh, the fact that we are now one year um, since the pandemic had been declared and Last year, one of the first presentations that, that we did after um, the pandemic was to talk about wildflowers. So it just made me think, you know, a, a year of despair, rejuvenation arrives, a spring emerges. It just, it really does feel like we're starting to, to get that despair behind us and move on. And spring is such a wonderful time to do that and to reflect it in the photography that you do. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, in this presentation, what, where, and how, and what is a few of the, of the flowers that do emerge early in, in the spring. And so the first flowers on the left are bloodroot. And if you look at that picture, you'll see the different stages of the flowers too. You've got in the back, um, the petals have dropped off and in the front, you've got the middle one is starting to lose its petals. Um, and this is taken from, from above. And the wonderful thing about bloodroot is that it has this leaf that's at the bottom of the stem uh, referred to as a basil leaf. And it just has this beautiful way of wrapping around the flower. And they're very, very early. The, some of the first flowers that, that you'll see whoops, will, be, will be blood root. I'm gonna, <clears throat> the next one is uh, in the middle is trout lily. And the trout lilies also come about the same as time as the blood root. And they have a really beautiful leaf at the bottom. And this one is just a, a, a close up of the trout lily itself. And then the, the right hand one are our Virginia bluebells. And I like this picture because every once in a while, the bluebells are not blue, they're white. And this one was taken at Easton Park. Uh, and bluebells, will, the leaves of the bluebells are starting to poke up. I'm starting to see the first signs of, of bluebells. Uh, they're, really, they're really a beautiful flower and, and um, so wonderful to see. Um, on the next slide, a um, couple of, of different things, flowering dogwood. Um, and the flowering dogwood, the flower is actually the, the yellow in the middle and the white are called bracts, um, but we always refer to the white as the flower itself. Um, the one in the middle is Dutchman Britches, and I just love this flower. It's got such detail, and if you get the, the light right on the Dutchman Britches, the, the flowers themselves are translucent. I'm going to need to, uh, if, if the screen keeps doing the auto, I'm going to have to go back and discipline it and change it, so sorry about that. Um, but Dutchman Britches, um, I see them at, um, at 
the state park, Shenandoah State Park. I've seen them at Cool Spring, not in the main area, but if you're familiar with Cool Spring, there's a metal gate. And if you sort of um, look down along that metal gate area, they, they, were, they were opposite that metal gate on the hillside. They tend to like to be on hillsides. So I'm going to, oops. Here we are. So the, the Dutchman bridges have this really pretty, they're in a cluster. And so one of the decisions is how do you include all the different flowers in the cluster? Uh, but in, in the um, Shenandoah River State Park, where I find the Dutchman bridges is if you're familiar with the park, if you come down the, the big hill and you go to the right hand side, um, it towards the campground. There's a there's a boardwalk um, behind the right campground, and they're all on the the hillside, um, and they're they're fairly early. Um, and then another flower I really love um, is the wild geranium, and they're a little bit more long lasting than some of the wildflowers that come up. Bloodroot comes up, and it's only around for like ten days or so. But wild geranium tend to be more long, long lasting um, type of flower. They're, they're, really, they're really a pretty flower. So, so some of the flowers that are, are most wonderful in this area are trillium. And we have several different types of trillium, but two that I commonly see here are the one on the left is the toad shade trillium. And that one, that's all the flower opens up, but I just think it's elegant in its simplicity. And then the large leafed um, trillium, the grandiflora, which is, um, is something that you'll see at Thompson Wildlife Management Area. Um, it, it's famous for the trillium. And what the trillium do is they start out white and as they age, they get more color and pinkness to them. So it's not, at first I used to think, uh, we have white ones and pink ones, but that's not the case. It's, it's as they, they age, they start to get color. And so the more you go to, to Thompson, the more you start to see the variety in the colors of the trillium. So those are just some, some of the flowers that very early on that you'll see. And I also, um, I know weeds can can be um, invasive and block out other flowers. But for photography, for me, uh, I also will take pictures of weeds if that's all I see. And dandelions are up already. Um, and I always have liked this quote from Emerson, what's a weed, a plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered. Um, and so that's Emerson. So. So where to find wildflowers? Um, and I've just listed some areas. There are probably many, many other ones. But the top area is Thompson Wildlife Management Area. And if, if you haven't been there, it's in Linden. Um, and it has, um, I think, the best display of wildflowers. Um, and I start going there. Um, probably um, early April, and I'll, I'll continue to go um, a, every couple of days because it's almost like a feast and a carpet that's laying out incredible um, wildflowers. And so what starts there is your, is your blood root um, and followed by trout lily and then the trillium will come and the trillium blanket the hillsides. If you haven't been there, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a show. Um, Shenandoah River State Park has great wildflowers too. They've got the bluebell trill, but don't forget to go near the campground on the, on the right river, right side. There's the, a boardwalk and the boardwalk's great for two things. It has, it has may apples, it has Dutchman britches, it has all sorts of flowers on the hillside there. Um, and it also has great, um, great 
frogs and different things, depending on how wet the, the area is in there. Shenandoah National Park has, um, has over 862 species of wildflowers. Um, it's half of their vascular plant species that are found. And then 20% of the species in the flower are asters. So that's the wonderful thing is just as the fall is coming, the asters are blooming. There is an incredible amount of beautiful wildflowers that again, uh, as soon as they start coming up every week is a different show. Um, starting with, with, there are some trillium there, they're harder to find, showy or orcus. Um, but the big, the big displays, and when I really like to go to the, the park is when the, um, is, is when some of the mountain laurel start to come out on the hillside. It is just exquisite. And then in the middle of, of the summer, you get, you get the lilies coming out. Um, when does the mountain so laurel come out? The, Whoops. Oh, the mountain laurel. You, and the other thing about this area is that if you start seeing it at the lower elevations, you can photograph it at the lower elevations. So our mountain laurel comes out, I'd say early June, oh. um, maybe the end of May, it depends on how, how warm the weather is, but I have mountain laurel just down the street from me. So I oh, watch okay. it here. And then I then um, I know that it's gonna start evolving in the park because that elevation difference, um, things bloom a little bit, a little tiny bit later in the park, depending on- Also the on higher the elevation, the later bloom? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And so, you can, you can have, you know, you can have um, that experience of seeing something down at Easton Park and then say, oh, if I go up to this higher elevation, like the dogwoods and the red buds, they're going to come a tiny bit later. Okay. And they're going to stay a little bit longer. Okay. But the mountain laurel, mountain laurel loves to be on well-drained hillsides. And <clears throat> This section of the park, the north section of the park where we are closest to, has great mountain laurel, like starting at mile post um, nine and then a little bit further up, but the hillsides are really pretty. Oh. And then after the mountain laurel, the wild geranium, not wild, wild azalea, um, and they've even, when they built the road, they move some wild azalea so you see it along the along Skyline Drive. Um, and that's a really pretty show. Um, and then the next thing that comes after that uh, is um, there's, um, there's um, white flowers like snake root and they're just, it's just a whole different show. And what I would recommend doing is going on their website that wasn't hard to find. They have a spring wildlife calendar that I'm showing on the screen here. And it shows, um, it shows the different species and whether it's early in the month, middle of the month or late in the month. Uh, and so again, with the way our weather's been, it's going to give you an indication um, of when it might start blooming but things, things can, really, can, can really change. But you can see um, the early ones are service berry, blood root, um, the Dutchman britches, um, toothwort, trout lilies. And then, and then later in April, you start to see the different ones to, to find. The large leaf trillium um, historically at, um, at Thompson, they're, they, you start to see a few of them um, lower down you, um, as you, you walk the different path there. You'll start to see some of them maybe mid-April, the third week in April, but really the show can be anywhere between the last week in April and first week in May. And then, um, and then they just start to, they start to fade a little, little bit. Sorry. Call from Rosalind Hill. Sorry. <laughs> so, so it really does pay to, to know. The, the other thing is that um, 
that the state arboretum has a thing on their website saying what's blooming and at the arboretum you'll get um, native blooming of flowers and that's going to be in the native plant section uh, and then in their in their more in their gardens you you'll get other types of blooming but that will will pretty much tell you um, where to where to go the, the National Park used to do a wildflower walk um, and that used to be Mother's Day weekend. So the, the peak for flowers, when you get to the higher elevations, like, um, like the, in the midsection of the park, uh, like St Stony Man and Bear Fence and the little hikes that, are, that go up, those are gonna be May for, for like the, the most variety of, of wildflowers and I don't know what their what their plans are this year I, I, I kind of don't think that they would do the wildflower walk it when I first moved here 22 years ago um, it was a really easy it was easy to get a spot in it and then it became really popular so um, Eastern Park and Front Royal uh, as well as any bottom lands are really are really beautiful for uh, being able to see um, to see Virginia bluebells, and the other places near Dennis and Manassas, um, the bluebells there uh, are just famous. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the challenge of being able to photograph something that that's carpeting the, the ground like that. What do you what do you do with the bluebells? But definitely. Um, that Eastern Park has, it has bluebells. Um, I've seen, I've even seen a few trillium there. I've seen um, Jack in the Pulpit, which is one of my favorite little quirky um, plants, which is mainly green. And the males have a little, little Jack pulpit. The females um, don't. Uh, the museum in the Shenandoah Valley, my guess is that the new hiking trails are a little disturbed maybe from building, but that there will be more of the natural wildflowers along the hiking trails and their formal gardens are, are starting up and you know it's, it's good to do there. Sky Meadows, um, also there's bottom lands, most of the, most of the um, flowers I'm talking about, you'll find at Sky Meadows too. And Sky Meadows and uh, Shenandoah River State Park and the new Seven Bends Park all have, um, have wildflower meadows that have been uh, planted and maintained. And uh, last year, they weren't as well maintained because volunteers weren't able to go in. But um, the year before, there were just wonderful flowers all year round. And um, they both in Sky Meadows, oh, it's, um, I'm sorry, in Shenandoah River and Seven Bends, their wildflower uh, patches are near where their beehives are too. And so you get a lot of, um, you get a lot of the pollinators coming in there. And, and so that's a great place to, to visit because you get different blooming at different time. And then the one I mentioned that I haven't been to, um, but encourage people if they ever um, want to get adventurous is to go to Dolly Sod's Wilderness Area. I don't know if anybody on, on the group has been there. The I, reason I, that, have you been there, Janet? Yeah, quite a few times, yeah. Not recently, yes, but <clears throat> just not to interject, but <clears throat> what's unique about it, I. I started in college in an ecology class. My professor took us up there because it's unique. It's, it's a transposed Canadian environment. It has wild cranberries and flora, you know, that's more indigenous to Canada. So it's, it's very unique. It's super windy. I mean, trees are just have branches at the top and uh, at the tree line at, at on one side. So it's very interesting, very hard to find. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, you know, yeah, good no, I, I <laughs> and um, it's it's actually subalpine, as, as Janet's saying. It's it, you'll see species there that you won't see elsewhere unless you go to Canada or, or um, British Columbia or Alaska. So 
um, it definitely, if you're feeling adventurous, that's that's one of my goals. Also in West Virginia, um, Blackwater uh, State Park has rhododendron and wild azalea that's just exquisite, you know, along the, the, the water. It's, it's really known for that. So there's plenty of places to go out and see wild wildflowers here. So we're gonna talk a little bit about technique. As, um, as you know, I always like to get very intimate with, with the subject that we're doing. And so um, the thing about wildflowers is they're very low to the ground and we'll talk about that. But um, the basics we've been talking about in almost every presentation, light, composition, different ways you can use your cameras. And then I'll talk a little bit about equipment that can help with, with doing wildflower photography. So the first thing is, is light. And um, this is another picture of a blood root and the light is coming from the sort of side and back. And um, it just changes the feeling of the flower completely. And so flowers do best in soft light. They photograph very poorly in bright, harsh light. And so light's gonna become a significant factor. Last year, we were um, in supposed lockdown and what I was doing when I was going up to Thompson, because it was like, I can't miss a year being there. I've been doing it for 21 years. Um, is I was going at, at dawn. Um, there were there were times when the sun was rising, and I could see it through the woods just to avoid um, being um, being breaking out of, of uh, lockdown here and being in trouble. But what I discovered is that even though you can almost do photography anytime at Thompson because there's a lot of shade there, the morning light was exquisite. It just really really was beautiful. So this year I'm I'm going to have to get myself up and out into, into doing um, photography in, in those, those, those golden hours. So the next slide, and I have a number of slides from um, this one source, which is um, uh, CanadaNaturePhotographer.com. They have a whole, um, they have a whole little booklet on, on wildflowers that's really excellent. Um, but as I said before, the best light for wildflowers is soft, diffuse light. Um, the harsh light just will, um, you'll lose all of your details and your highlights. Um, and so you really don't, you really have to be careful with light. Um, and you can create light if, if you don't have it. So different forms of light on a cloudy day, soft overcast light, strong backlighting is really good. And I'm gonna talk a lot about um, lady slippers. They're one of the most difficult flowers to, to photograph. And the other is electronic flash. What you do with electronic flash is you expose. So if you took the picture without the flash, it would be black, nothing would be there. And then you use the flash just to illuminate the flower. And that can be a really beautiful way of isolating just the flower from everything else that's, that's going on around there. So what you do is first manually expose, take a picture. If it's all black, you're good. Then you put your flash on and now you just have a picture of, of the flower itself. So that's a technique to use. So one of the important things is that you need to control the light. And first thing is the way you can control the light is go when the light is just slanting and beautiful and golden hours, either early in the day or late in the day. You can shoot in shade. A lot of, the, of our wildflowers like to be low and in shade. Um, the, the Dutchman birches are always on a hillside. Uh, so a lot of times um, you can find flowers that are in the shade. The other is to bring an umbrella along, like even a small umbrella and pop it up and 
filter the sun with the umbrella because it's it really can help. And then if you uh, any color umbrella, does it matter what color the umbrella is? Lighter's a little bit better, so it's a little translucent. Okay. You're trying to create like like soft clouds above. Okay. Um, and they even sell, and I have these little pop-up little round things that you can you can place. So you're filtering you're filtering the sun. Um, so, and I apologize for the slides. I just for some reason I can't control them. Uh, the other is that because a lot of times your flowers are in the shade, sometimes you need light, and you can bring a flashlight or. Um, they sell them at, at a lot of the stores now, the, the little LED lights, like a little panel, and you put them on and you can light the flowers from above or below. You can light through, this, through the petals so you get the uh, vascular structure of them. So I always have a, a little bit, a, a little light, and I have this little Lumi light that is very expensive, um, but the flashlights work just as well. So I, I usually have a, a few things with me to try to try to do that. Sometimes even asking somebody to stand and create shade it also works too if you don't have an umbrella. <laughs> hey, hey you, stand there. You were shading and it was okay. And then you add light back. So the next thing is composition. And a lot of times we think about composition with big mountain scenes and things like that. But composition with, with flowers, I think is really, really important. Um, and it can be very, very difficult because flowers, um, it's not like um, taking pictures of, of your family group and you can compose them. Flowers will grow where they wanna grow. And a lot of times they're growing in this confusing mass of stuff, you know? So you have to, you have to, be careful about which flower do you want to do. If you've got, um, like, especially with the Dutchman britches, which are in these clusters, can I, can I find the one that is on the edge so I can just isolate that one flower? Um, and it, sometimes you don't want to isolate, but a lot of times I like to isolate <clears throat> and only have one flower in my story because you want to draw our attention and you want to remove distractions. Um, so this picture, this one is um, a wild columbine, which comes in, I'd say June, July up in the park, um, maybe even later, maybe July, August, I'd have to look. Um, I love wild columbine. I take it from every angle. I take it from below looking in and um, sometimes I, I think of the top of it as little joker hats and sometimes I want them perfect. And this one, one's folded down and, and an angle. And they will, the, the Columbine will be along uh, Skyline Drive on those rocky outcrops. And here I just looked for one that had trees or green way in the background to, soft, to have that soft background behind it. But it took a long time walking around and saying, can I find the one that doesn't have other parts of of Columbine that's going to be hard to remove from the picture. So, um, but yeah, Columbine is, is really, really beautiful. So the decisions that you can make is, do you want to focus on a single flower or part of the flower? Um, do you wanna focus on a flower with many around it? Or are you photographing the feeling of overwhelming amount of flowers. Like if you were in a sunflower field, like McKee Birches in, in Maryland, the sunflowers are in, in July. And sometimes you want a part of a sunflower, but sometimes you wanna feel like, oh, there's an overwhelming number of flowers here in the field. Um, and I tend to not want sky or visible edges when I do this cluster of flowers. And again, this is from the Canadian nature photographer.com. It's, it's a great little, um, a little document that they have on wildflowers. So for me, these are two flowers that, that I did last year. And yes, it's a daisy, which is invasive, but I like daisies. Um, and the other one on the left is, um, is a pawpaw flower. Um, and they're brown, but they're very, 
they're very pretty, you know, like if you just look at a pawpaw tree, they're not very pretty. And again, this idea of isolation and there's two pawpaw flowers there. There's the green one that hasn't bloomed yet. And then there's the pawpaw flower on, on the right hand side. Um, and I like the, I like the detail of the um, bark in that one and the simplicity of, of that. So my style a lot of times is can I find the flowers that I can isolate and have simplicity in the picture. Um, the daisy on the right, the, the um, background is grass, but it's far enough away from the flower that it, it just blends and adds a nice texture to the background. The, the other thing that I find people will do when they go out to start to take pictures of the flowers is that they tend to get stuck either taking the pictures all horizontally or all vertically. And the story changes based on how you hold your camera. You don't need to take them all in one direction. In fact, when you go out, the wonderful thing about flowers as opposed to birds is they're sitting there. The light may be changing a little bit, but you can say, I'm going to take this one real close. I'm going to take this one um, portrait. I'm going to take this one horizontal. So shoot in both both directions. Don't limit to only one type of plane of direction when when you're photographing. Um, get creative uh, in how you do this. So the, these are pictures taken with my my um, iPhone, I think. Maybe it was. Um, and I always look for distractions. And then I'll remove or clean the scene around those distractions. I will never pull out natural, um, natural things around that flower. But if it's a piece of grass that doesn't belong there or a leaf, I tend to clean, clean the scene up a little bit. Um, and the most important thing, if you see, I'm going to go, go back, is you see on the picture that was on the left, there's this. Um, sort of line that's going from the front flower backwards, those are little branches. And I find particularly when I'm up in Thompson that these little branches that are behind flowers, they're lying there, they're not attached. I'm not breaking off a real tree, but those little branches pick up light and they're really distracting. So you'll see me on the ground and I'm, um, I'll take a picture and sometimes I don't even see them until I look at the picture in the back of the camera and I say, oh, if I remove that little tiny twig that's sitting behind that flower, now I don't have that line coming from that front flower. It's as simple as a tiny little branch that's, that's changing and picking up some highlights in the, in the picture. So take a picture, look at the back of your camera, see if there's something that's catching light that, that can be removed from the scene without um, damaging any vegetation. Insects, butterflies, and I would add birds are always a plus to flower photography. Um, the, um, the black, I, I, summer is black eyed Susie's and I love black eyed Susie's that was taken at uh, the Shenandoah River Park in their pollinator garden, not last year, but the year before. Um, both of these pictures were taken in pollen, pollinator gardens, the one on the the right, I think, was taken at Sky Meadow. And I didn't even know that little spider guy was there until I, I got the picture back and looked on, on the computer. And, and I love it even more because of the spider. Um, it just, it tells much more of a, of a story. And you can, you know, I got so close to the, um, the flower on the right that you can see the pollen tips and the, the pollen. The other thing that adds is um, water and dew drops on, on flowers. They just make them so much more texture and interesting. And so if you, had um, a morning where you had um, rain overnight or, or dew drops, uh, they definitely um, can, 
can light up and, and make leaves and flowers really, really pretty. Um, and what I'll do is um, I will bring a little water bottle and I will actually add a little bit of dew drops. Um, if I'm photographing with other people, I'll, I'll always say, has everyone taken, taken their pictures? Um, and if everybody's ready, then I'll, I'll add a little bit of, of water um, just to, to change and, and add some interest to the, to the pictures. And then this one was a, a, a stock image um, that I showed when we did the abstract photography. So getting abstract with the flowers is okay too. You know, if you're sitting there and you've done all of your pictures and now you say, I'm gonna go super close and just take a really interesting part of the leaf and the flower. Um, you don't have to be realistic. You know, that's a, <clears throat> that's a choice that you make as you're doing this. Am I focused? Because I want a perfect picture of the flower. Am I taking a picture of, of the flower real size with a reference point so I can identify it later in my books? Or am I doing art? And you can do both. That's the, again, the wonderful thing. Those flowers are not running away from you. Um, and you can start to see shapes and lines and color and, and get creative as we did in, when we did our abstract photography. And again, um, art versus realism. Um, the picture, if it's come up on your screens, the next picture on the left um, is a combination of um, red bud and dogwood. And the way I did this all in camera um, and I did it with my telephoto lens, I was walking down the street and I saw these beautiful red bud trees uh, and behind them were these dogwoods. And what I did with my telephoto lens is I focused on the dogwood fl flowers and bracts. And because I was far enough away, what happened is that with depth of field, remember um, depth of field will, will affect the foreground and the background. So the shallow depth of field, and it blurred all of the red bud in the front and the focus was on, on the, on the dogwood. So that's a, that's a, a technique you can use. You can do it with grass that's in front of flowers or other flowers so that uh, you have a yellow flower in the background and a yellow flower in the front and you just purposely blur your foreground and make it a color. But you know, this is, if I was trying to do something about dogwood and that was my subject, I would never blur red bud in the front. Or if I was doing something on the detail of the red bud, I would want to more focus on the red bud. Um, and again, this is a tiger lily um, in, in Shenandoah National Park. And that has a lot of detail um, all the way from the top of the flower to the little dots, to the way the, the um, stamen and pistons are, are hanging down. Um, so again, um, do you want to do abstract? Or are you doing more realism? And you know, challenge yourself and do a little bit of both. The other thing is, do you want to do the whole flower or part of the flower? Um, you know, sunflowers are great for doing just these details um, because the actual, if you look at the sunflower, it's a compound flower and look at all the little tiny flowers that are, make up a sunflower in the middle. Um, and so you can decide how much of it do you want to focus on. The picture on the upper, upper right hand area is a May apple. And if you're familiar with May apples, um, they started these uh, in April as these beautiful uh, green leaves. And then the flower is underneath them. And it's, it, it, for me, impossible to take a picture of the, the top umbrella and the flower. And so in this one, I decided, I just wanted the story to be about the Mayflower 
itself and not worry about um, taking a picture and getting that top sort of umbrella that was in there. Uh, and then I did in um, post-production do a lot of blurring of the background. But again, um, it may be hard. Uh, if I was teaching a class on Mayflowers, I probably wouldn't take this flower. I would try that way. I tried to take more of the identifying elements. And then um, the beautiful thing that we have at Thompson is we do have lady slippers and they are probably the most difficult flower to to photograph there for an, a number of reasons. They, they grow in, in clusters. They, for some reason, always have poison ivy around them um, when I'm trying to do them. If it's bright out, you don't get the detail of the bulb. Uh, if you take it straight on, um, it's sort of not a pretty flower. It can, they, it can look really weird. <laughs> It's got a lot happening to it. It has the leaves going every which way at the bottom and has the, the flower itself. And then it has these things that are coming down from the flower. It's really difficult. It takes a lot to um, get in the right position. Um, and if you've got a lot of sun um, with these lady slippers, they tend to, they tend to get a, a really bright highlight area on that front bulb area. But it can take a lot to do them. The lady slippers come out um, usually as the trillium are, are, are peaking, the lady slippers will come out. So if you wanna see lady slippers, it's, it's usually um, first or second week in, in May and they are on the hillsides. And when I first was going there, they were really hard to find, but now so many people have walked up to them um, that there's there's pretty well beaten paths um, and you know we can we can definitely do a, a, a meetup and I, I can show you where where the lady slippers are um, and I have found some now that are a little bit more accessible but getting in and isolating can be it can be a real real challenge again whole or part um, these are the mountain laurel I, and I, I just they're they're tricky to photograph because again there's a lot going on with them. Um, they're never in these sort of when you see one you usually see a bunch of them and so you decide am I going to focus on the flower itself one little flower and they have these fascinating little um looks like springs inside the flower so you can decide my story is going to be about the detail of the flower, or I'm gonna to try to capture them um, in a cluster to, to feel like it, you're walking there. And one of the paths that I found in Shenandoah is a couple of different areas. There's, there's um, Jewel Hollow area has really pretty um, laurel in them. And then, and then do you wanna play with the light? and I liked, um, I purposely darkened um, the one on the right and just wanted to get that feeling of what the cluster was like. Um, and again, the one on the right shows some that haven't opened, um, some that are open, but it takes playing around with them to get uh, the mountain laurel and, and some decisions as you approach them, you know, how am I, how am I going to really capture the mountain laurel? They're, they're really beautiful. So some of the techniques, um, as I always say, is to get low if they're low. The nice thing about mountain laurel is they're, if you get in a nice cluster, they're usually eye level. So you don't have to, you don't have to crawl around on, on the ground too much. Um, the trillium are low, blood root are really low, trout lily are really low. Uh, so a lot of the flowers, the, the blue bells are really low um, because they're understory and they're, they're just, why put the energy in trying to get high up when they're, you're not competing with um, big leaves and the understory at, at, at that point. They're, they're purposely there before the trees leaf out too much. So the, the other reason to get parallel is because um, a lot of flowers aren't on a single plane of focus. And you, if, 
again, with depth of field, if you want to get as much of the flower cluster in focus as possible, the more that your camera is at an angle, the more it is further, if, you, if it's further away from some flowers than others, you can, you can have the need for more depth of field. Um, so here's a couple of different um, people that are, are photographing. And, and these are all, all from stock images. Um, a lot of times you'll find me on the ground, um, on my belly doing wildflowers. Um, I've been on the AT, um, which runs through Thompson Wildlife Management Area and people have, have um, seen me and then they come running up and say, are you injured? And I'm like, no, no, I'm, 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 I've almost got this flower. <laughs> you know? um, <clears throat> one of the flowers that is there too, it's a, a showy orchis. It is tiny and it is low and it is always, um, <laughs> it is always so hard to photograph. Um, but you wanna get low and if you have a, um, either using your arms or a low tripod um, that can help stabilize. So the first picture, again, you know, for illustration purposes is, yeah, you, you may have to get low. Um, the next one with the iPhone is for, for the life of me, everybody keeps their, their phones at an angle or their cameras at an angle. And what that's doing is if the flower is angled in parallel, you're fine. But if it's not parallel to the flower, now parts of your lens are closer <clears throat> and parts of your lens are further away. And you're going to not have as much depth of field. <clears throat> so if, if the example of the one with the red flower is if, um, if, if you wanted to take that flower from above, totally be um, above that flower and, and almost what, what you would call plain, a plain view or um, parallel. Think about being parallel to your, to your subject. With the daisy, I would be shooting that not from the angle there. What's happening is you're going to be, if you look at the daisy with the, the bee on it, um, the front of the flower is going to be much closer to the top of the lens than it is the bottom of the lens. You've created distance and people do this with their cameras all the time. They're not conscious of, of whether they're purposely angling because the flower is also angled. And so you want to, to angle the camera to keep parallel. But if you look at the one with the, um, the camera phone, those, those flowers are standing up pretty straight. And all you'd have to do is just rotate that camera phone so it's more parallel. Now you're gonna get more depth of field of that flower because the top of the phone is closer to the flower than the bottom of the phone. And that's, that's taking your lens and angling it. So you're creating different distance for that camera to take and the further away something is, you may lose depth of field. Um, and you purposely may wanna angle it to be creative, but do it, be conscious of, of how you're holding your phone um, or how you're holding your camera. Um, and that's why a lot of times I'll use a, a level, um, I'll, I'll look at the level in my camera. This is one if you are in the Android or the iPhone, um, course, I use this as an example. Um, this is a blood route that's at Easton Park. Um, it's if, after you walk by the river, if, you're, if you've parked at the, at the river end and you're going up to it's the high school, um, it's, it's along on the left-hand side, um, pretty much been there. But if you do the typical thing of standing above it, you're going to get with your camera phone, you're going to get everything in focus because that camera phone wants to focus on everything that it can see in its lens. Um, so what I did is I used the rock to tell the camera phone 
there's nothing, there's nothing to focus on further behind. And I tried to get as parallel as I could down on the ground with the blood route. So going back to what I was saying about removing distractions, um, there's no reason, unless you want the story to be about the blood route and the sticks. Um, if I was taking this and taking a little bit more time, I would carefully remove the oak leaf to the right. I'd remove the stick behind it. You can see how um, the eye starts to go to the lighter areas of sticks too. So I will carefully clean an area. Um, and then if I find something that's a really, um, there is a jack in the pulpit that lives along that trail too. And I have clean leaves around it. I take the picture and I put the leaves back because I don't want anybody to pick it. So that's the, so I, I'm also conscious that up at, at, um, at, at Thompson, people are pretty respectful and they don't, don't pick flowers. But I'm constantly looking at, is there a way that I can simplify that picture by where I am and removing debris that doesn't need to be there? And then that little tiny green leaf behind is another flower. I wouldn't pick that. You know, so I'm, I'm really, I'm trying to be ethical and not destroy things. Um, so get close. You need to learn how close your camera and lens can focus. And, um, and you can see with this trout lily um, that the front area of pollen was in focus. And I was so close that even the other, um, the other areas of po pollen, they were all falling out of focus. And I had a lot I had a lot of depth of field on that. A macro lens, um, both on your camera or your phone can really work well to do more, more close-ups. And again, the yellow that was created with this trout lily is another trout lily, but it's, it's not in focus. It's far enough away from the other trout lily to create a pretty background. Or if you have um, auto settings, you can use the uh, macro setting on your camera if it has an auto setting or on an iPhone um, or a Android if you have portrait mode. Um, portrait mode on those phones make you step further back from the subject. Um, and I also discovered on the Android some of them even have a food setting and the food setting was doing some really interesting things to flowers. So you, but every, the, how close you can get is the minimum focusing distance on the lens. I was out with some people taking pictures and, and the woman was saying, my, my camera's broke and I can't focus on this flower. And she was like, she was like not even an inch away from, from the flower. As I say, get close, get clo as close as your lens will permit you to get. Not all lenses will permit you to get close. And believe it or not, you can get blurry images because sometimes um, I'm there and there's wind. And so in the wind, you want a faster shutter speed um, in a camera phone, burst mode, and in a windy day, take a, a lot of pictures. But that can be the most frustrating thing is, you know, all of a sudden a wind comes up and, and um, everything's moving. So don't forget that, um, that movement. And if you're really tired and you're not on a tripod too, are you blurring because you're, you're not able to hold the camera steady? So the next slide talks about your focus points um, and there's different ways to control your focus point. If you're on a um, regular camera, um, make sure you are not on auto focus point that's different than auto, auto focus. There's some ways that your camera will select the focus point for you. You want to make sure you're on single point focus. And you can either focus and hold the focus and move it or move your focus point to that area on the flower that you're trying to focus on. So if your focus point is in the center, but you're feature is down and to the right, 
move your focus point. Make sure you know where your camera is focusing, particularly if you're close up. Um, I've just seen a lot of times where people have, have missed the, the focus point, especially if you're on, if you don't have a lot of depth of field. On your camera phones, you can control your focus point by tapping on the screen and then locking that focus point. The picture on the right's an Android. The iPhone is just a square and it also has a lock. And it, when it's white, it's been selected. And when it's yellow, you've held it there and it will pick that focus point. And it's really important because flowers can be complex and you can control those focus points. That's the first, that's the first thing you wanna do. And both, with both cameras, if you lock your focus point, you can recompose, you can move your camera left or right, but don't change how far you are from the subject that you're taking. That's the advantage of being on a tripod. But if you have the time, change your focus point. So with the um, silk flowers there, if you want the focus point to be that front flower, lock the front flower, stay on it. Then if you want it to be a back flower, lock it and change it. Same thing, move your focus point on your, on your regular camera from down into the, to the right front to the top. You know, be conscious of where your focus points are. Um, that's real important. And on your camera phones, um, on, your, on your macro lens, most of them don't zoom. I have taken wildflower pictures, a lot of them on my one to 400 because it does have a, a macro focus. If you're using a zoom camera, it's sort of counterintuitive. A lot of the zoom lenses or the built-in zooms are best focused when not at 100, but at 400 when you're zoomed out completely. But play with your zooms and see where it's catching that, that focus as a detail. On the camera phones, um, a lot of them now have zoom features. On the iPhone on the left, your standard zoom um, for close-up is 2x. But if you tap on the 2x, this um, dial will come up that's shown on the bottom and you can get closer. The 0.5, the one is, is actual and, and two times are your your optical lenses in the 11 and, and also in the 12. And they are the best, they are the best resolution. But I found that as opposed to zooming in to take a picture of a mountain, using the in-between um, settings on the 11 and 12 do work, do work fine. I found on the Android that I was playing with that the 3X was one of the best for close-ups. Um, and you can just, on the, on the newer Androids, it's, it's the number of, of trees that you see. But play with your zooms. If you're using iPhones, see how close you can get to the, to the different subjects. Um, and also, um, if you don't have a zoom feature on your phones, the clip-on lenses do work really well for macro. Um, and sometimes you have to get super close to them and figure out how to clip them over one of the lenses on your camera. So exposure is really critical. We talked about it with light, particularly white uh, flowers. Um, if you overexpose or underexpose, you lose detail. If you overexpose, and this is where if you've got um, on your camera, the ability to put highlight alerts or blinkies on. If you overexpose a, a picture of a flower, you will lose the detail and the venation of the petals um, because all the details are in the highlights, which is the brighter areas of the flowers. But it's really easy, particularly in light, to overexpose over them. So you need to check your exposure. Underexposure will make them seem murky. Um, and you can always add shadows in. So again, when we talked about histogram, you want your histogram to be, if it's a brown mid-tone area, it might be more to the middle, but you want it to be as far over to the right without actually touching the, the far right 
uh, side because you can add shadows later. So this is um, another, another good article I found on the internet. And it's just saying ex you expose for the highlights. That's the histogram. The reason we've got a big uh, spike in the middle is that's your, your midtones and pink and green are midtones. But that other hump that's there is all that really pretty white that's inside the petals. Um, and you would not have that detail if your histogram was all in the middle, if you just did the midtones. So the more you're over to the right, the more dynamic range you'll get. And dynamic range um, says that you're capturing in the field more of the colors that are there. If you're all in the middle, you will not capture those subtle highlights in, in the flower. So how do you do exposure compensation or, or make sure your exposure is right on your, on your phones? Um, this applies to Android and also iPhone, is when you tap on the phone to do and pick your, your, your exposure point, a little sun will come up. And if you just move your finger up and down on the screen, it will darken or lighten and the exposure of that screen. And that's really um, that's a really good thing to do when you're when you're taking pictures. So what will happen is when you tap on the iPhone, if you tapped on the white, it's going to darken everything. If you tapped on the darker purple, it will lighten everything. It's it wherever you tap on your smartphone, it's also taking that exposure reading. Um, if you are on a on your regular cameras. Most of you are on, um, on matrix evaluation and it's taking an average of the whole screen. So you are the whole scene that you're looking at. So you may have to do exposure compensation if you're in aperture. If you're in manual, you can just pick your mid-tone area and expose for that. Um, but just watch your histogram in the field. So depth of field is really, um, becomes very much a decision that, that you need to make creatively with flowers. If you look at this, um, this violet, and I did, I did do a filter on the, on the background in post-production, but I have a lot of depth of field in the center of the flower, and then the back leaf starts to fall off. But I was extremely close to this flower and I had set for detailed depth of field. Um, but that's a choice that I made because I really wanted it to be around the highlights in the middle of the flower. So a quick review on depth of field. Um, and a lot of the presentations that we did earlier are, are posted. Depth of field is the aperture opening in your, in your camera lens. It is not in the camera body, it is in the lens. On your um, smartphones, your aperture is either like F14 or um, F, I think a lot of them are 2.2. So they're very, very, um, a very shallow depth of field. Um, and what the picture on the right is showing is that as you, your F-stop increases and you get more depth of field, that aperture or the little hole that opens up starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And when it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, that means less and less light is coming into the actual camera. And that's significant for wildflowers uh, because you make a choice about how much depth of field you want. If you have a complex flower, if you're really close to it, a lot of times you need a lot of depth of field to capture from the front of the flower to the back of the flower. And if we're shooting in shade, we don't have a lot of light and that's where flash ends up coming in uh, for macro photography. So again, every lens you put on your camera will change the range of depth of field that, that you have available to you. So this is a, another um, illustration on the next screen that I, I got from the internet and another good site to look at. 
depth of field is a decision that you can make. Um, and this one shows the same um, picture taken at the same ISO, different shutter speeds in different depth of fields. So in the first one, to get that, that smooth, non-distracting background, you're at a very shallow depth of field, more lights coming in, so you didn't need as much time on the exposure. One way, if you didn't want to do a 50th of a second, say the flowers were, were moving, you would then up your, your ISO, but they kept the ISO consistent on this. Um, the middle one is um, sort of mid depth of field. Now what's happening is in particular, look at the flower um, that hasn't opened up to the left of the daisy. In the first one, it's so close to the daisy, but it's out of focus. And that's the thing you need to remember about depth of field. It's not just the background, it's the foreground too that gets affected by depth of field. The middle one, that front little bud is starting to be in focus. Um, and, the, and the very top daisy is in focus because it's probably closest on the same plane as the, as the um, front daisy. At F11, now you're getting almost everything that was in the scene in focus. So if your story is about um, the daisy that lives with all these other plants, then you would pick a lot of depth of field. If it's wanting to focus and isolate a shallower depth of field, but know that depending on how close, even part of the daisy could be out of focus. So that's a choice that you make. That's the most creative choice. If you've got a lens that allows you to change depth of field that helps you with your photography. And if you were in the field and not sure, do it at, at different depths of field just to see the difference. So the factors that affect depth of field, it's not just your f-stop. It's how far your lens front is from the subject you're taking. So if your lens is close and it's at an angle, but this flower is upright, remember, that's why I, I say to be conscious about your plane of focus and how parallel you are. So it's, it's how far you are from your subject. And this is important too, when you start to try to use your camera phones, um, but, but know that affects it. If you want that pretty green background, how far is the subject from its background? How isolated is it? So if you remember that, um, that lady slipper, I found an area where a lady slipper didn't have another flower right behind it, but green behind it. And that takes, that takes some practice in the field and some vision of being able to say, you know, I'm going to get the flower and knowing this lens and knowing my f-stop, I know that the background will blur. It's the type of lens you have too. Um, if I'm having a, a, my macro lens versus my, if I'm shooting a flower with my telephoto lens, which I do, I get, I get um, less depth of field with my telephoto lens. It will compress depth of field. And again, that, that plane of, of focus. So here's two practical examples on the next page on choices on depth of field. The, picture of the dogwood bracts and the flower itself. I was with my um, 100 macro lens. I practically had the lens sitting on that front brack of the flower. So it's incredibly close and I needed F22. And I also took it with a flash because that helped isolate it from the other dogwood flowers. Um, and I needed that light because I, there wasn't a whole lot of light. And as I went up to F22, 
that opening in the aperture is really tiny. And you can even see at F22, the front of the BRAC is not in focus. So a lot of people think of depth of field as being needed because there's a big mountain scene out there and it's not. If you've got a wildflower that is going from foreground to background and it's the whole story of that flower and you want to get as much of it in focus as possible, you need a lot of depth of field. The bluebells on the other hand, um, I took that with my telephoto lens lying on my side, and that's at f8. And if I had gone higher than f8, then a lot in the background would be included. And there are some of the bluebells that are in focus and some of them that aren't. You can even start to, if you really study it, the top blue ones start to fall out of focus. The front leaves start to fall out of focus. But what my focus point was, was on the, on the flowers, um, the, the sort of towards the left. So when you're out in the field, what you want to do is, is play with it. You can vary your depth of field. And again, this is from the um, Canada Natural Photographers site. And you can see the difference in this rosebud of F2.8 and F22. It's taken um, almost with the same. And now the water even becomes um, bokeh, that sort of out of focus water. And again, what do you want to do? Do you want to do something abstract where you're just taking pictures of the petals? But the reason why they needed F22 on this, on the rose, is because the rose has a plane of focus that's going from the foreground to the background. So again, if you're, and this was a, a macro lens, a 60 millimeter, and they were probably pretty darn close to that, that flower. If you want to get everything in focus and the flower is, is moving from the foreground to the background, you need lots of depth of field and you need a lot of light without being harsh light. And so a lot of times we do add light or flash when we're at the higher, higher F stops. So going back to, um, to doing depth of field or focus points with your, your phone, because your phone, remember, is going to be at those lower f-stops, 1.8 or 2.2, 2.8, you can trick it into having depth of field by being very conscious of not having infinity in the background of whatever your subject is on this fungus. Um, and then choosing your focus point. So in this one, I chose the fly as my focus point. And if you really look at it, it's doing the same thing as um, a more expensive camera. It's blurring the foreground of the fungus and it's blurring the background because this was the whole universe of the scene. That's the trick with the, with the camera phones, not a big universe behind there. Um, and then tapping and picking a focus point. It will blur your foreground background because its f-stop is also very, very, um, it's, it's a very shallow f-stop. So with your iPhones, how can you get depth of field? Um, one way is to go into portrait mode if you have an 11 or a 12. And in portrait mode, you can pick the type of light you can also, if you click that little um, arrow carrot on the left-hand side that's shown, what comes up is, um, is your exposure, but also you can change your depth of field, your f-stop. And so you can, uh, you can play with your, ex your exposure, you can play with your f-stop. And the trick with the iPhone is if you take it in portrait mode, you can change the f-stop even after you've taken the picture in the editing mode. It's, it's pretty cool with the 11 and, and 12. And what it's doing is just putting a blur um, around the areas that were not your focal point. So you can, you can get really creative. 
again, with portrait mode, sometimes you have to step further back from the subject, but your phone will tell you that. The newest Androids also on the next one, this is like the Android um, Galaxy that, that I was playing with for a while. If you go into portrait mode in your editing, you can then put all sorts of filters on it. You can do selective color, um, which is really fun to do in, in editing later. Um, you can say the only color I want is yellow. You can do a spin or you can add a blur later on. Um, so again, if your phone has other settings like portrait mode or food mode or any of them, you can play with them. If it doesn't, you know, you can snap a lens on. But even that, if you don't have any of that, if you pick your scenes right and you tap that exposure point, you've got control over what that camera phone is doing and get creative. So your biggest decision, do you wanna go shallow? Do you wanna go deep? Um, you wanna go shallow if your story is about the one crocus um, and you wanna blur the background. This one is, this one is a, a more shallow depth of field that is being shown on the crocus. The next picture is um, Lupin in a mountain and of course, the photographer here made a decision. I want to go deep. I want the foreground. I want the the conifers. I want the sky. I want everything. Um, so this is this is a, a deep depth of field. Again, you're making a decision. Do I go shallow? Do I go deep? If I were here in this um, Lupin field, I would take some probably like this to show the whole picture. But boy, I'd be on that ground looking at, at the intricacy of the lupin. Um, for me, that's just my style. Um, I just, I don't like a lot going on. This is, a, this is pretty because it does show the whole, but don't forget the, the details. Shallow or deep, this is a decision you're going to have to make when you get to your bluebells. And, um, you can do with a really shallow exposure, you can, because you're in a field of bluebells, the bluebells behind the bluebells that are the front picture create a soft background. <clears throat> and again, um, you have to be very conscious of your focus point because if you miss your focus point, your front bluebells too will, will not be in focus. So the focus point on this one is the front ones. Um, all right, so I've got some challenges here. Um, I took this picture with my iPhone. This is what you're going to see when you get to Thompson Wildlife Management area. This is where the blue, uh, the lady slippers are. There's, there's, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on with the lady slippers. Um, there's some wild geranium in the background. There's, um, there's giant, uh, there's trillium coming up and <clears throat> there's some weeds, there's poison ivy, there's trees in the background. <clears throat> so what do you do? This is this one, we're gonna do participation on these challenges. What do you do? Well, if you use a low F stop, then you can start to wipe out the stuff in the back. That's one solution, low f-stop. Anybody else? Zoom in on your subject. Zoom in on the subject. Yep, what else? See if you can use an umbrella or another person over on the other side to shade so you don't get direct sunlight. Yeah, because the sun's, that's, that, that's what happens with these, um, with these lady slippers is, is the sun comes through and you get this sort of, you get this sort of highlight area in, in the bulb. Anybody else? You can run the ISO up and then use a flash. You could flash so that you just have the, the, um, the you, you black out the background and you flash and it would be some trial and error. Okay. So what I did um, is I said, in this case, 
I'm, you know, and I never got rid of the highlights. These, this one, the highlights are sort of blown on the flower. I mean, they are really, really, really tricky um, to do. But what I did instead is I said, I'm just going to try to take it from the top down. So, you know, is this perfect? No. But what I wanted to illustrate with this is as you're standing there, <clears throat> think about all the tools that you have. You've got f-stop, you've got shade, you've got all sorts of things, but you also have different angles. And sometimes changing your angle um, can create an interesting picture. Is it my favorite lady slipper picture? No, because I've got, I've got lady slippers that I've, I've managed to do the, the whole, um, the whole picture. All right. So these are pictures that I, I got from stock images. Cause I, I really, my goal here is for everybody to start thinking strategy. So here's this, this is a, this is a poor, this is a poor little um, uh, trillium. They're much, they're much prettier. This one, this one's sort of sad to me. So what's going on with this one? What's our, our critique and what's the, how do we fix this? Too much direct light. You want to shoot from the side or get an umbrella to shade it. Yeah. You got shade. What else is going on? Um, I would get, I'm getting closer. Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, there are some, there are some, when you walk in Thompson, there are some trillium that you just go, oh, that one is just beautiful. This one's not, this one's sort of, this one's sort of not as pretty as some, but what would interest me um, is the lines that are near the yellow there. I probably would go really, really super, <clears throat> super close on this one and just do the angle of the yellow and the, the lines coming up. <clears throat> I would take away the, um, the white flower on the left corner or, or basically yeah. put a vignette <laughs> of dark around this whole thing so it just focuses on that middle. Yeah, so that's gonna be a challenge too when you get up there because um, sometimes they're by themselves, sometimes they're not. But again, if you, if you look for one that's more isolated, um, there's probably a million of them. So you don't have to take like the, the one that isn't the most attractive. Um, maybe this one's coming into its own. I don't wanna, I don't wanna make it feel bad, but I, I would probably take a pass on this guy and look for one that's more isolated. I also don't like, <clears throat> sorry, the leaves that are sticking in from the side. I don't mind the one in the bottom one, but those are sort of, one of them's in focus, one of them isn't, there's shadows. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot. Take a pass, just, you know, wish this one a good life, but maybe not the, <laughs> <laughs> not the one that, that is your subject. <clears throat> All right, so you come across this lady slipper. Um, what's your strategy? <laughs> these are ones I took from Getty's image. So these are pictures that people thought were good. Um, I would put it in a different, um, when you talk about the um, rule of thirds, it, it just looks like it should be taken further down. Yep, yep. Instead of all that stuff on the top. Yep. I don't know if you can just kind of take a clothespin and just get some of the grass out of the way. I don't know if that's legal or not, but. It definitely is like clothespins or if you bring a little bit of string, but this is grass and it could be panic grass. I would probably, you know, I, this, I would pull the, I would pull the grass if it's oh, okay. grass, you know, okay, if it's, I just if didn't it's want to get my hands up, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no grass. Um, there's a lot of invasives. Um, that's the one thing when you go up to Thompson, you're going to see a lot of garlic mustard and um, the, Yellow mustard is native here, but garlic mustard is horrible. And 
you know, I'm, I always pull as I'm hiking garlic mustard and try to stomp on it or, you know, get it from the, the roots. So if it's an invasive species and you know, it is get rid of it, but um, you know, cause I, or, or if you, there have been times where I just, you know, will use a little bit of a string. There's a woman who takes beautiful wildlife flowers and she just, she totally will, will pull and, and use string to change the area. You know, again, you wanna be respectful, but if it's um, something that doesn't belong there, you can, you can definitely move it away. Um, so here's, here's what the bluebells are gonna look like in um, either Shenandoah River Park or a lot of places. Um, here's your, here's your bluebells. Um, so what's our strategy here on the bluebell trail? Mine isn't showing the bluebell yet. Okay. I've still I know there's oh, always there a little. There it is. <laughs> oh, wow. I think I'd lower the exposure. It's, they look kind of blown out. They look blown out. What else? I get lower. Yeah, a lot lower. I think I'd want to try the path to see what angle that would give to give that part of the story if I was doing an overall picture photo. Yeah. Yeah, this is definitely overexposed. <clears throat> They're really tricky. I, I still don't have one um, of either the trillium or bluebells that show them all that I'm happy with yet. Um, and I'm, I'm really tempted. This sounds terrible. It, um, and I brought, I brought a wide angle lens. I might get really low with a wide angle lens because your macro lens isn't wide angle. <clears throat> or I would, um, I might get down and use, take my, my um, iPhone out of my pocket and try to snap it with the iPhone. Because the iPhone low, really on the ground, might do a really great job. Because remember, the iPhone does want to get everything it can from the front to the foreground. Um, but I think you need a wide angle lens to really do this justice. And if you're out there with your macro lens on, it's just not going to do it. Um, so I'm yet to have, again, when, if you haven't been to Thompson, you'll know what I'm talking about is as you're walking up the hillside and <clears throat> it being so blanketed with trillium, I've, I haven't gotten one yet that, that I'm totally happy with. This is, this is a real challenge. And so you'll find me saying, I'm just going to, get down on the ground and those um, ones on the left-hand side that are lying over the trail, I might do, I might do from the front to those to, you know, before the, as the trail is turning and get rid of everything else, because there's so much going on here with the trees. And if those front trees weren't there, the skinny ones, it might be more interesting, but again, there's just a lot going on. And what happens is your eye starts looking around saying, should I look at the trail and the, and the twigs on the trail or the bent leaves in the front or, oh, look, there's something through the woods there. And it sort of makes me hyperactive, <laughs> you know? So I don't know where, where to look, even though there's a leading line in, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's just, a lot going on, but you, you're going to face this. This is what you'll see. So a lot of times I'm trying to do more little isolated clusters. If I want to get the feeling of, of being in the blue bells or mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just tricky or even trying the, the foreground blue bells with a more shallow depth of field hitting, maybe the, you know, focusing mid instead of front. Um, but this would take a lot of experience experimentation for me to get something that I'd say, yeah, this, this is, is I'm happy with this. And you so want to do it because it's when you're there in a bluebell field, it's not one bluebell, it's all of these bluebells and you want to give the, the viewer that feeling of being in there. So that's going to be 
that would be a good challenge for everybody is, can we solve the problem of an attractive field of bluebells? Um, there's one that um, if, if people know um, uh, Tim, the, the PR guy from, from Blandy, he, he won one contest with an iPhone picture of bluebells through the woods, but they were straight. There was just a straight field of bluebells and he cut the, and there was a nice uniform set of trees and he, he only had part of the trees and that gives you that feeling. So I, I know everybody wants to do the path through the woods, but it may or may not work for, for bluebells. So the next one has a, another bluebell challenge. Um, again, a Getty image close to what I like to do with my bluebells, but this picture has a few challenges to it. So what do you think's going on here? If, if it's come up on your screens. I'm not sure where the focus point is. Is it just those front two? That's good, Ingrid. The focus point's horrible on this. They, I, I don't know what they were focusing on. Um, yeah. You know, I can't tell. I think the histogram on this tell, would be dark. It would be dark. Yep. They cut off what else the flowers. Yeah, they cut off the flowers and the flowers are leaning to the right. That's your leading line. And it's like they cut the flowers off. That's like that's like taking a picture of somebody's hand and you know, not having the tips of their fingers. You you've got to make clean cuts with with the flowers. And that's where it does take it takes some time to really look at them and look at your angle and say, do I have enough of the flower to make it attractive? The other challenge with the bluebells is you'll, you'll have the pinks and then you'll have, you see the little, um, the little pieces of bluebells where the bells have actually fallen off. They're very light and they're attracting the eye. And again, you know, if you have a thousand bluebells, can you pick the one that's going to most be attractive from a composition standpoint? People don't think about composition as being really important. Flower itself has so many elements to it. You really need to study, you know, what way are the leaf, leaf veination, <clears throat> what way is the stem, what way does the eye really want to follow? And sometimes flowers are a confusing mess and it takes a little while to do it, but don't cut off important parts unless it's purposefully done like with the sunflower. You know, like think about, is cutting it going to be attractive or is it going to say to the viewer what happened here? I also think that either the depth of field is causing the fuzziness or there, it just, it's just sort of, they tried, but it, it's sort of a mess. So when the next picture comes up, um, I was going to ask, are the needles representative of flowers that were there before in the blue? Yeah, that could be. That could be. But then is that the center part of it? Do you want to then isolate a cluster of ones there and not there? You know, then then you you more focus on on that um, part of the story. So what's happening with with these um, with this? What's going on here? And the flower on the left is kind of distracting. Mm -hmm. If you wanted the flower on the left, what would you need to do? I'd probably back up a little bit you or else I'd up? only have half of that one. I would like kind of have it falling off the picture to the left. Mm -hmm. Technically, what could you do if you wanted both flowers? Oh, you'd have to... Um... You'd probably change, either change where you stand or change your f-stop. Correct. Yeah. This is, you know, this this can happen. You know, the the from the angle of the flower, the front ones mostly 
mostly fine, but the back one, you just, there wasn't enough depth of field. If you're going to have something as a big distracting blob, it either has to be part of it or not part of it. Um, you'd either have to really drop your f-stop or change your angles so you don't have them on, on different planes of focus. But this is what can happen uh, because of, of f-stop. And people would say, well, you've got a fuzzy picture. It's not your, it's not your shutter speed or anything. It's, it's the f-stop dropping off. This is a depth of field problem. Um, and then um, when it comes up, there's a pretty um, field with poppies and Any thoughts on our poppy field if it has arrived on your screens? Hmm. Might move so you don't have so much dark in the background if you want all the poppies. Yeah, lower. Um, particularly, Dennis, you see that white one that's sticking up that next to the red flower in the sort of top, not quite middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a, quite a bit of daisies or something that are catching the light in the, in the background. Um, what else could you do if... How, I'd like to see all of them in focus that are lit up because your background's blurred, but the front's part blurred and part not. Yep, yep. So Ingrid, you're right, go one way or the other. Yeah. Uh, either focus on that front poppy really close and a very shallow depth of field and you would get potentially a really pretty bokeh background with reds and yellows. And you know, it could be, it could be really, really, it could work depending on your lens um, or um, go with more depth of field so you can see everything or as Dennis is saying get rid of more of the background um, you know just isolate more I would have gone vertical but that's the go vertical yeah. um, as opposed to take a horizontally framed it I would have gone vertical yeah or even you know when I'm looking at you know even step um, and this will be hard to describe because um, I, I want to like, like show you, but I would maybe take it on an, on, I would maybe go to the left and angle all the red in low um, because there's less of that tall stuff that's hitting light in the background. So a lot of times I'm just and just moving around a little bit and looking through the camera. And again, these flowers, the light could change, but the flowers aren't running away. So, you know, like look at it and be strategic and say, what if I move this way? Will it create a nice blur in the background? What if I want it to be about that one tall poppy over on the left side? Um, one of the things I haven't talked about is sometimes I like taking pictures underneath flowers looking up through them when there's light like that you could do a really cool thing under that tall sort of poppy with just looking under it um, and that's part of the problem here too is we've got some some perspective under and some is some is sort of straight on so I might do the whole thing underneath and see if I got a really cool effect underneath but this is the type of thinking that I really want everybody to think about is that as you approach it, you know, take some time. Um, and flowers can be, it can be an overwhelming scene and you just need to sort of look around and say, is there a way to move and get creative? Um, you know, the do I want to isolate? Do I want the whole? Do I want to go close? What will my equipment let me do? OK, 
Okay, another challenge, which is, um, this looks like a different Columbine than our Columbine, but it's, it's a Columbine. Um, so what's happening with, with this picture when, when you get it on your screen? Distracting flowers in the background. Mm hmm I'm pretty sure that the point of focus is the point of the end of the leaf of the flower rather than the center stamen and so on of the flower. So it yeah. makes the center blurry and the leaf petals crisp. Looks weird. Yep. Yep. They missed they missed the focus point. And they were close. And the challenge is they wanted to do a a, a I think this one, yeah, this is a, a weird angle too. And, and Columbine are difficult. I've done some really weird angles looking into the Columbine, um, but it, it takes some thought because as Missy's saying, you don't want, the, you don't want those, those lines behind it. Um, and Sid's right, the focus points missed. And then the depth of field, weird things can happen when you don't have a lot of depth of field, but you're close. You either want to get it translucent completely or you get this sort of weird vibrating sort of not quite in focus look of the stems and, and the highlights. Um, so yeah, this one has a lot of problems and I don't, it's almost uncomfortable. You know, if you're looking at it, you sort of, you, you don't know what to do with your head and the flower doesn't look comfortable to me. It just sort of makes, makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> and what is, if when it appears on your screen, another lady slipper, um, what happened to this lady slipper? Hmm. It looks a little overexposed. Exactly. And so what did you lose in the overexposure? Uh, the detail of that, the slipper part. Yep. Yep. And I do like taking lady slippers from this angle too, because I, I sort of sometimes um, on the, on the flower itself, there's this like really nice gooey stuff that, you know, the pollen from the insects or, to attach to the insects. Um, so yeah, you know, um, but this one's definitely overexposed. And what happened is the green is perfectly exposed. You see the midtones are fine, but they blew the highlights. And if you had your um, exposure blinkies on, that area should be blinking. They are really, really, really tricky lady slippers. They, they blow out so easily on that bulb part. Um, the other thing is you've got that, <clears throat> that sort of partial exposure f-stop problem on the bottom leaf. You either have to have that bottom leaf in focus or totally blurred. If you had it totally blurred, the front of the flower would blur too. So I might again, depending on what's there, I might gently just try to, I would very gently push the green leaf up and the bulb up to see if it, without damaging the flower, I could get that front leaf out of there because it's really, it's a problem. You, you, you know, or get it in, get it a higher F stop so that it's in focus, but it's not blurred enough to, and if you blurred it, the very tip of the bulb would be out of focus too. And there's, there's, you oftentimes get this like dew or water on the bottom of the lady slippers. That's really nice, but you, you have to, again, um, be in position. The other thing on this one is I don't like the, the, the way the very top um, part of the flower is cut off. That tip is gone on the, on the very top. Um, and then there's something distracting over here. And there's another lady slipper in the back. This one would be better to do with flash if you wanted to get rid of the background. Um, but there's, 
again, when you're looking at it, you have to say, you know, can I gently position it so it's attractive? Should I do it from the side or should I, you know, walk around and see if there's another one that would be easier to photograph? Um, because, and then get your exposures right. Um, again, this, this looks like it was matrix exposed. It also looks like the focus point is on the back. If you look at the, the back left side up from the bulb, the, the actual hairs on that, that part of the flower, you can see them. So they had good, ex they had their exposure point, I think is a tiny bit off too. And what was happening is the exposure was being taken off all the green instead of the really um, light area. So some equipment that I might take out when I'm trying to photograph flowers is knee pads because I'm constantly getting down on my knees, on my belly, um, just different things. A small, flexible tripod, particularly to put um, my camera phone, that works really well. The other thing that works well on my camera phone is to attach the original headset that came with the camera and I can use the volume switches to be my shutter control. On the right hand side there's a picture of a camera with a ring light on it and that's a flash that goes on the front of your lens so that you can have the flash be very close to the flowers. And again a, a flashlight works fine too. Um, the water bottle to add a little bit of dew, an umbrella uh, to be able to create some shade, a flexible clamp that is actually sold to be able to control what other leaves are in front of the flower you're taking pictures of with, without hurting the flowers. In the middle bottom is a lens that fits onto a camera phone, and then uh, there are some reflectors that you can use to control the amount of light and the direction of the light and even the color of the light coming on your flowers. But a lot of times I just walk out with my, with my camera phone and my, um, my camera with, sometimes I'll again use my telephoto lens. I don't even do a, a set up for flowers because if a bird flies by, I want to be able to take a picture of that bird too. So there are a ton of resources on, on wildflowers. Um, the one that I referenced before, the um, Canadian nat, uh, nature photographer.com. Um, there's a Virginia wildflower app for both Android and, and Apple, um, the Virginia Native Plant Society. And um, there's also iPhone photography school has um, some information on photographing flowers. So there's a ton of stuff out there, always um, good resources. <clears throat> 